The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. Welcome to Vinnie Politan Investigates. In the world of true crime, there is one story, one case, that for more than two decades has continued to fascinate the public and absolutely frustrate investigators. I'm talking about the murder of little John Benet Ramsey back in 1996. When you think about what happened here, it seems like a very solvable case. The crime scene was fairly small and contained. It was John Benet's home. And the killer left a note a very bizarre ransom note. So from the beginning, it seemed that it should be very possible to figure out where this note came from because of the handwriting and the very peculiar information inside. But as we know, the case hasn't been solved, and still today, everyone is wondering, who wrote the note? I've been covering the story on my weeknight show, Closing Arguments, and what you're about to see are some of the most important moments from that program as I investigate the murder of John Benet Ramsey and the infamous ransom note. It's the highest profile unsolved case in the nation. It's been the subject of many theories and investigations, none of which have resulted in a successful arrest. On December 26th, 1996, six-year-old John Benet Ramsey was found dead in her family's home in Boulder, Colorado. Her parents, John and Patsy Ramsey, had reported her missing early that morning. Patsy Ramsey found a lengthy, handwritten ransom note in the house addressed to her husband, John. About seven hours after police arrived to investigate the kidnapping, John Benet's body was found hidden behind a latched door in the basement of the home. And now, a convicted pedophile has written incriminating letters. His name is Gary Oliva. Tonight, we will take a look at those letters and the original ransom note with our experts to see if the handwriting is a match. Plus, we'll speak live with the man who received those letters from Oliva as we investigate the unsolved murder of John Benet Ramsey. I want to get the backstory on this man, um, Gary Oliva, and, and the friend, classmate he was writing to. What, what's the story behind the letter, behind this confession? Uh, and so joining me tonight, folks, from Ventura, California, the man who received those letters from Gary Oliva, his former classmate, Michael Vale. Michael, I, did, I just didn't know how to describe it. I didn't want to say friend, but like he's sending you letters, and I know classmate, acquaintance. How, how would you describe um, your relationship now and years ago with this man, man, Gary Oliva? Well, really, there's three parts to that story. The first part would be pre-96. The second part, would, uh, then there would be 96, and then anything after 2016. But in the beginning, um, I went to a very small high school. And everybody knew everybody there. And uh, Gary was what we called an orbiter. He just would orbit around our groups and stuff. So I would, yeah, we were we were classmates. We knew everybody at school. There's probably 75 to 100 kids there at any given time. Uh, it was a rather small school. Okay, so you describe him as an, as an orbiter. Um... Was he always a little different? Was there always, did, 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 oh, did yeah. you and your classmates sense that, you know, one of these, uh, uh, you know, classmates is not like the other? Well, you know, we didn't really, we were just kids. We didn't really know about that stuff. We didn't have, I didn't have any idea that we have a naivety, you know, at the time, you know, being just young kids. But of course we knew there was something wrong with Gary. In fact, we called him Scary Gary. Um, he was known for breaking into places and getting art supplies. I mean, he could break in and steal things, but he was he was uh, definitely uh, into stealing art supplies and things of that nature. When I heard about the paintbrush, things of like that. There's so many uh, points that I have here. I have 25 points of um, 
evidence, what I would call circumstantial evidence. Okay, let's, let's, get evidence. To, let's, let's get to that in just a minute. I just want to focus on how we got to these letters. So let's start with um, when does he start writing to you and what is the, 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 the sort of the nature of the communication and is it a back and forth or is it a, a sort of a one-way street here? Well, uh, right after high school, I went off, got married, went to college, all that good stuff. And and um, Gary stayed in touch with the mail, the U.S. mail, believe it or not. Back then, that's how we got, we stayed in touch. So um, I was taking a TV and radio course, and I had access to um, uh, this fantastic studio. So I was making these funny cassette tapes with all their sound effects and stuff. And I popped Gary, was one of the guys I popped up with one of these cassette tapes. Well, he loved it. He mailed me back a cassette tape. And this went on for years, for I, I'm going to say 16 years, uh, getting cassette tapes and things from him and really not talking by telephone, um, which made uh, that phone call in 96, you know, very much. Scary. Okay, so let's, let's get to the phone call in 1996. This is when you say everything changes. And we know this is when John Bonet is murdered. So what was this phone call like when was it and what was said it was december 26 uh, it was almost midnight on the 27th uh it would have been the morning of the 27th you remember a phone call you get that's terrifying you remember it you remember the room you're in when you get that phone call and i remember about the christmas tree and everything it was december 26 and it was about midnight and i get that phone call and it's and it's gary's voice and he's like but he's like Oh, I just hurt a oh, oh, little girl. Oh, oh, like it was the most terrifying. I'm getting goosebumps just now telling you guys this because it was terrifying. And um, I immediately jumped into protective mode. Oh, where are you? What's your address? What's your phone number? And he kind of caught on to me, but he told me he was in Boulder. When I was like, Boulder? Why would you be in Boulder? You've been sending me mail for 16 years from Oregon. And now you're suddenly in Boulder calling me. Uh, anyway, he he, uh, he hung the phone up uh, when I'm trying to get information, and that was the phone call. Well, here's the scariest part. The next morning, I get to the L.A. Times on the newspaper um, on my front porch. It's, uh, you know, 6, 7 in the morning. I flip the newspaper open, and there it is on the back side. It says, it says, girl six slain in Boulder, Colorado. And I knew something serious had happened that night. I knew something serious had happened. I go, wow, he actually killed a girl. And that's when I called that number. Right then and there, I called that phone number. And I sat back and, you know, when you call the police, you know they're going to do something, right? I mean, that's their job. They they investigate tips, right? And here's my solid gold tip. But I sit back. I'm telling my wife, any day they're going to arrest Gary. Watch this. It's going to be, it's going to be incredible. And then all of a sudden... Uh, like every day would go by, every day would go by, and there's no phone call. I mean, there was no, there's no, the police never followed up. So after three months, I called them a second time. And um, I said, you know, um, look, I need to tell, tell you, I've got a really good lead for the, the John, now I knew her name was John Bonet. And I said, I've got a lead for the John Bonet murder. And they said, okay, let me put you through to the, the John Bonet line, quote unquote, the crazy person line, right? Because by now, thousands of people had called, thousands of, who knows, my tip got buried in there, who knows what happened. I'm still thinking Gary's going to be arrested any day. You talked about John Mark Carr earlier. And let me tell you something. Um, I knew when John Mark Carr got arrested, I knew that he was, I was like, what is this? I mean, I knew, I know Gary did this. I know who killed John Bonet. Coming up next. I do have a letter still sealed right here. It's dated uh, July 31st. I'm opening this, as you can see. I'm sorry, I should have done that on the... Okay, this is a very, very detailed letter. Now, back to the Court TV podcast. The John Bonet murder was the biggest true crime mystery in the country. And there's a witness who alleges he has incredibly important information, information that could be tied directly to the killer. He calls police. And now, as I continue my discussion with Michael Vale, we learn what kind of response he got when he called investigators. 
Never any response from, from police. You make, you make the initial call, you make the second call. Did they ever get back to you? No, the Boulder police never contacted me until the TV show 48 Hours and Lou Smith, Lou Smith um, followed up. Um, and actually Alex Hunter, the district attorney for Boulder, Colorado at the time, drove out to my apartment and, and Ventura. And I gave him evidence of some of those scary things that Gary had mailed me over the years. We're talking handwriting samples. We're talking hair of from missing kids posters, really scary stuff that he had started telling me, uh, uh, sending me. Uh, what I forgot to tell you is that the at, over the 16 years, the things he had sent me got darker and darker until it was like including tape, tape recordings of where he's simulating a rape of a child and really horrible things like that. So, um, yeah, it was, it was getting pretty scary. And then 96 happened and I knew that he had done something very serious. So when do you get a letter where he, now, cause over the phone, I would consider that a confession too, right? I, I hurt this girl. He says he's in Boulder, right? So that's one part. When, when do you start getting letters or the letter where he purports to confess to the murder itself? Right. It's an interesting story because um, in May of 2016, I had had enough. I had found Gary's Pinterest page. It was basically a trophy page uh, to John Bonet. There were 65 photos of John Bonet in there. And I just went livid. So I thought, what can I do to help this case along? What can I do? And here it was 2016. So I wrote my, uh, I have a friend who's an FBI agent, sent her a, a three page email. She said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Within a month, Gary was arrested and he's got an undetermined sentence. And so, he's still in prison. It's still in prison now. So, I mean, the, the guy clearly so, has issues and, and, and has problems. And the question is, is he the one responsible for, for all of this? So you you get the the letter from him. What do you do with the letters once he starts confessing to you through these letters no what, what the way that went that happened is that um within a month he was arrested and i was like oh wow it was like a backpack full of rocks it was like relief i finally was free from worrying about gary loose in society it was the best feeling in the world and um i i thought that was enough that's what i needed right and then but what happened was is somebody said hey why don't you write gary a letter and ask him what he did that night or tell me and I, I said, that's a brilliant idea. So I started sending Gary's letters. To my surprise, he started sending them back. And uh, I tried everything to try to get him uh, to, to talk about his life and the, just about everything, about how this got to this point, you know, and about John Bonet and his obsession with John Bonet. Um, we talked about every detail. And then, he, I mean, what happened is he start, I couldn't get enough details from the letters. So I had him start to call me um, on the telephone and uh, re recording those calls. Now, Michael, I understand that you just got another letter today. Oh, yeah. From Gary Leva? Yeah, matter of fact, I do have a letter still sealed right here. It's dated uh, July 31st. Do you mind opening it and tell us what Gary has to say tonight? I sure do. I sure do, and I gotta tell you, we've got some amazing uh, details coming up. We have a new private investigator that's working with us, and. Um, it's really helping this case a lot. I'm very excited. Okay, so I'm, I'm opening this, as you can see. I'm sorry I should have done that on the... Okay, this is a very, very detailed letter. Um, I haven't reviewed this, but as you can see... Let me just approve this, make sure it's okay. It says, generosity brings psychological benefits. It's some clipping from a, it's interesting, you know, the things that he sent me. And, and now he's kind of changed his handwriting even more. And he writes very small and, you know, I'll, I'll spare you guys. I won't read this to you, but it's, uh, it's, it's been quite a journey for 27 years. Get, trying to get, keep just this give us a small flavor, a small flavor of what he wrote. If you could read a couple lines from it. Um, in the garden, there are patches where others have dumped things of little value that need clearing out. 
and tilled ready for planting that are patches where no matter one tries to grow, a surface then dies. Still to come. Some of these weird little strokes that are awkward, those are unique to that individual. That's a really loud announcement. Now, back to the Court TV podcast. The note was lying across the run of one of the stair treads. And it was kind of dimly lit because it was very early in the morning. And I started to read it, and it was addressed to John. John Bonet was murdered in the house and hidden downstairs. But at first, everyone thought it was a kidnapping because of the bizarre ransom note left behind. Now it's time to take a closer look at that note and see what it reveals. Take a look at the, the ransom note. This is, you know, one of the most significant pieces of evidence in the case, and yet they haven't been able to connect anyone to it. So we've got Gary Oliva confessing in a letter and writing tons of letters to Michael Vail. Um, so what we want to do is compare uh, Gary Oliva's letter to the ransom note to say, hey, are there consistencies here? Does it look like the same person could have or did write these two letters. I want to take a look at um, sort of like a layover kind of comparison that Moselle did. We have something we could put on the screen here, which compares the, the TH, the IF, the U, and some of the words here. Um, Moselle, why don't you begin to explain this and, and what it tells you? Well, for me, it's, it's really about the nuances, the little things that are not common. It's, it's important to look at the common similarities as well, but it's also important to look at the uncommon things. For example, a lot of the people who are at home armchair sleuths, you know, they will look at it and say, oh, well, I, it doesn't visually look the same. But if you can, you know, everybody kind of learned the same way in school to a certain extent. And so there's going to be some commonalities. So when you overlay them though some of these weird little strokes that are awkward that are not common like a little bend in the t stem or an arch in the h those are unique to that individual so when you overlay them they line up so well that's a really loud announcement in my profession okay uh dawn um let's start going through some of the letters now let's start this is like going back to school with the letter a uh, and the comparison of the A. So what did you find in this comparison of the letter A? I think we're going to put it up on the screen. Do we have it? Here we go. All right. Tell us what we're looking at. Sure. So when you look at these, you might think at first, oh, these don't look the same. One starts and one's, you know, on a upward slant to, cur to curve over. However, if you lay these two over, if you take the blue A and you lay it over the black A, it almost lines up in that arch that bends around. You can see how they line up a little bit. And then there's also an indentation on that right-hand side, which I think is on another um, slide later that you can see in the same location on both sides, both documents, those um, nuances or the anomalies exist and that's what we're really looking for is you can it's easy to spot things that are similar but what we're really looking for is those things that aren't really obvious but we can still find so that's why we really dig in and take our time with these analysis and dig up a little bit more or dig through them a little bit more so we can find those similarities and the dissimilarities because we want to have a, a broad analysis we want to know what's different and then we also want to know, okay, so how many traits are similar so that we can stack those traits? Because like Moselle said, some of us are going to have very similar writing because we learned in schools that taught us how to write the same letters. So that aside, as we grow, we start creating or start developing our own style and our own personality comes out into our writing where you can see someone else's handwriting and recognize, okay, yeah, that's my mom's handwriting. So that's what we're looking for beyond that. What else is in that writing 
that is unique to both documents. What's the standard when you compare? Is it like uh, more likely than not, not inconsistent with, or what, what's, your, what's your conclusion? So for me, I use a five point scale, which basically five would say, absolutely, there's no way possible this person could have written this. And in my opinion, again, this is just my opinion. So for this, I would be at about a 1.75. Uh, I would love to have seen more handwriting, but you know we can only work with what we have access to. But based on everything that I looked for and looked at, I had dozens and dozens of samples of Gary's. I, you know, I started at 250, went up to 225, then was at a two, and then ended at 175. So what? And what does 175 mean again? Means pretty close to certain, but you know. You can okay. never say 100%. Right. So, <laughs> so. It's, it's, it's very close. Okay. So, Dawn, very close. what was your conclusion? So, I started out more at a 3 4 in the very beginning because I didn't do the deep dive. I was still um, just did a peer review. And the more I started digging into it, the more I started doing the overlays, I could see more significance in the similarities. And this is a compelling argument that there's a lot of anomalies in here. And so I did manage to get down to, and I was I was on a two for a little while, but those O's and some of the numbers, the, the A's that have a little indentation that exists in both documents, they were a little convincing. So I'm down, I'm between a 175 and a two. So in my opinion, it's it's plausible. So the John Bonet murder remains a mystery, but it's a mystery that many people who have studied the evidence see completely differently, and that's a major problem. The other problem is the disconnect between the family and some of the investigators. Now, I don't know if this case will ever be solved, and I don't know if there will ever be a trial here on Court TV for the accused killer. But what I do know is that little John Bonet will not get justice until we know the truth. I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks for joining the investigation. There you have it. If you want to see more in-depth reporting on the latest true crime stories, you can see me every weeknight, 8 p.m. Eastern on Closing Arguments. Thank you so much for downloading. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.